Thank you very much. I'd like to echo Arlene's gratitude to everyone at Bay Dizzy and all the support that we've received. And it's an absolute honor to be here with you and to share a few thoughts with you on the CRPD. In addition to have disability advocacy in Israel, I've also shared with Naomi and Jean that I am part of the extended Bay Dizzy family. My cousin's son benefited for many years from Bay Dizzy, and so you are very dear to me, and it's an added pleasure to be here with you. Professor Cantor was kind enough to set the stage on the CRPD, leaving me some more of the fun to discuss various aspects of the negotiations, where the convention is going around the world, what it's doing, to touch upon issues of legal capacity. The CRPD, as many of you know, is the first human rights treaty of the 21st century. It is affecting global change. It is the largest, not to sound too much like a law professor, but the largest law revision, law creation endeavor around the world. Less than one quarter of the world's countries have systemic disability laws. And whether they have ratified the UN Convention or not yet ratified the UN Convention, it is also creating a civil society development and a focal point around which DPOs, who have always been active, but now have a goal in mind and a uniform goal in mind, to work towards achieving their rights. Put simply, it has changed people with disabilities from objects of charity to subjects of rights, and that includes not only the actions of state actors, but also, very interestingly, the actions of large international NGOs. We are seeing many of the old world NGOs like Handicap International and the Christophils Blindis Mission, CBM, move from a provision and rehabilitation area, all of which is necessary and does good, but now including a rights-based approach and fomenting and encouraging advocacy around the world. Most of all, it has created an expectation of rights. It's created a point around which people are claiming their rights and asserting their rights, perhaps for the first time, and with the lever to do it. Nothing about us without us is a theme we've heard it quite a few times the last few days, and so we are in a very exciting time. I still have to caution, though, that it is very early within the process. Just as we were finishing negotiations on the CRPD, there was a side session, an information session between the actual negotiations, and uh, the chair, Don McKay, was there, Professor Quinn and I uh, were the other people, and we told the disability community that, yes, they were seeing the end of the road, we would have a convention, they had won the marathon, that was the good news. The bad news is it really was a triathlon. Most of the work lied ahead. And so it's really very early in the process. It's hard to see, it's e very easy to see some of the problems that are out there, it's harder to discern very quickly what some of the good practices are, although in that respect, and especially within this region, we're all looking forward to Professor Cantor's book. Ah, free. So we all have a bright future ahead of us. Well, why is there a disability treaty? Why do people with disabilities need a specific treaty? We know that after the UN was formed, we had seven core or legally enforceable human rights instruments, each of which apply to people with disabilities, because we are people. We are covered under human rights treaties. We are human. Nevertheless, they were found to be especially ineffective in relation to persons with disabilities. For example, a special rapporteur, or what the UN system would refer to as a special master or an expert. Leandro Desway in 1993 said, if we don't have a special disability treaty, people with disabilities will continue to be the end of violations and to receive their, and will not receive their human rights. Unfortunately, he was correct. In the decade after his report, there was a total of 17 complaints to the entire UN system that related to disability, and 13 were found to be inadmissible. So four admissible complaints on disability over a decade. Most of all, what we found was that disability was invisible. Although there was a movement to have a disability treaty in the mid to late 80s, Sweden at one point proposed it to the General Assembly, Italy at one point proposed it, and in fact brought along with it a draft treaty. Said this is a great idea and here's what we think it should be. The UN said that they were subject to treaty fatigue. They were writing too many human rights treaties and so people with disabilities instead received soft laws and declarations. 
years of, years of disability, decades of disability, but not legally enforceable disability rights. Most of all, disability continued to be invisible from the UN system. The largest endeavor that the United Nations has done has been the Millennium Development Goals. It's a huge project. It was intended to have worldwide poverty by the year 2015. It's not succeeding. Consider this for a moment. One of the Millennium Development Goals relates to education. We know that of the 70 million children of primary school age around the world who are not in school, roughly one-third have disabilities. We know that in the developing world, and this is true especially in Africa, less than 2% of children with disabilities ever get to school. Yet, it's not included. I could give you other examples, but perhaps most plainly, if we're looking at the eradication of poverty, 20% of those living under the poverty level around the world have a disability. And yet, the word disability does not appear anywhere near the Millennium Development Goals relating to poverty. In the end, the reason that we moved forward at the United Nations was in large part, as always, due to politics. Mexico led a coalition, and especially they had support from the developing world, that moved the General Assembly to consider. The General Assembly did not approve a disability treaty negotiation. They approved a ad hoc committee. So the ad hoc committee met eight times for two weeks each. They the first two sessions, they considered whether there should be a disability treaty and what type of treaty there should be. They decided that it would be a human rights treaty that was holistic, meaning that it included civil and political, or if you like, non-discrimination, both a human rights treaty and a development treaty combined into one. At one point, the EU was very strong in opposing anything other than a non-discrimination treaty. And during the first ad hoc session, the United States was a lone voice which called for not having a UN treaty on disability. They said it was a matter for domestic concern, individual countries, not of international law. During the second ad hoc session, the US softened a bit and said that they would not oppose it. It was a shame, though, and again, to be quite blunt about it, it was difficult as an American to be at the UN to see a wonderful delegation of people from the United States, many talented people, including the head of our Disability Division from the Department of Justice, not allowed to speak from the UN floor. But they were wonderful people and they helped quietly and on the sides. What's notable about the UN Treaty as far as the dynamic going forward is that of participation. Again, we talk about nothing about us without us, but this is the first human rights treaty in UN history ever to involve the targeted groups. This is the first time that stakeholders were involved. And it is my hope that this will set a precedent for future human rights negotiations. The DPOs at the first ad hoc session, people with disabilities who were registered numbered around 85. By the end of the eighth ad hoc session, there were close to 850 persons. As you looked around the conference room at the state's parties and their tables where they sit with their nameplates, states began to bring back disability experts from their home countries. That's not to say that they were always disability rights advocates. In particular, the gentleman from Yemen was not what anyone would call a disability rights advocate. In fact, at one point, there were so many persons with disabilities sitting at the state's tables that Nigeria asked the chair, could you please remind the people with disabilities that they cannot sit at the state's tables, they have to sit on the sides and in the back. And the chair responded, but those are the state's representatives. If we are in the conference room of the negotiations and this is the dais upon which the chair and others sit and you are the states who are sitting in the audience, uh, there would be projected to my left and to my right above us the text of the actual convention which they would cycle through and states would make formal interventions. They would suggest that this word be changed or that this concept be added either because of legal clarity or cultural reasons. The daily summaries, which is how people know what happened during the day across the UN system, were not provided in alternative formats. And it was left to the DPOs and to friendly NGOs, including for one or two whole sessions, the World uh, Union of, of Progressive Judaism, to put those into accessible formats so that everyone could share. Um, besides that, the UN room was also rather inaccessible to those of us with wheelchairs on the side. There were stairs.
But most of all, this is probably most important, in the entire UN system, there were two accessible toilets. And so that's why we all get to know each other really, really well. Um, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, about three years ago, in his culture is an extremely profound statement at the lack of access and promised that the reforms in the UN would include, when they renovated, an accessible building. And he's keeping his promise. So the future looks better. Most of all, what we had was an International Disability Caucus, or IDC as we call it, which was an umbrella group of some 50 formal DPOs plus individuals plus academics. Some of the ideas were not uniform, but during the negotiations, the IDC spoke with one voice. And at the end of each of the negotiation sessions, the UN runs from 10 to 1 and from 3 to 6, the IDC was given time to present its view on those particular articles. And here you had people with disabilities speaking at the UN, presenting their views on very complex matters, and in many cases, as Professor Cantor has mentioned, taking the lead and setting the agenda. In the area of legal capacity, uh, the interventions made by the IDC were especially helpful. They ranged from extremely poignant descriptions to more lighthearted but rather pointed discussions. One of my favorite is Robert Martin from New Zealand, who's part of People's First, who when discussing bank accounts, which is a very clear matter of legal capacity, said he didn't understand because he came from what was considered a rather progressive country. And it wasn't until and he was in his late 20s he was able to open a bank account because he had an intellectual disability. And there was this company called Enron that had lost billions of dollars. And they didn't have intellectual disabilities. So why were they able to run their finances but he wasn't allowed to run his? He stated it with good humor, but the point is rather clear. There were also very effective sloganisms besides advocacy. There was a pen that was given out early on before the draft articles that said, disability convention, yes. And if you look at the web streaming on the UN site at the day, December 13th, that the UN convention was adopted, you'll see that Kofi Annan in his second to last day at the UN returned to the General Assembly Make his pen with disability convention, yes. So sometimes these things really can move forward. So what is in this CRPD? What is, what is its content? Without going too much through it, because I'd rather talk about where it's going, it is again a holistic human rights treaty that combines civil and political with economic, social, cultural rights. I note that there is no specific definition of disability. It is the only human rights treaty that has an article of purpose that is entitled purpose. And the reason that it's entitled purpose, in theory, is that one, a state cannot reserve, cannot say, we'll adopt this treaty, but we won't do this part of it or that part of it. You cannot reserve against the purpose of a treaty. And where is the purpose clearer than under an article that says purpose? And in that purpose article, we see the social model of disability. Individuals with mental, physical, intellectual, sensory, long-term impairments, that in interaction with the environment, it's not inherent, it's not scientific, it's not a defect, but in interaction with the environment cause this category of disability. And therefore, the social model of disability is not only in the preamble, but it's in its purpose, and we have to honor it. Most of all, the convention is about the right to live in the activities, just as if you did not have a disability. The right to go to the store, to go to school, to raise a family, to have a bank account, to give a speech, whichever. It's about the right to be equal. And it's also a recognition that people with disabilities are equal, have equal worth and equal value, and that people with disabilities contribute to their societies. In most of the world, or at least in most of the democratic world, when an individual reaches the age of 18 or 21 or whatever the majority age is, it is assumed that he or she, and unfortunately in parts of the world it's only he, but it is assumed that that individual can and will make their own decisions. They can decide where to live, who to live with, whether to have children, whether to marry, what, or in many of the world's countries, there are guardianship regimes that often, but not always, but often restrict this type of ability of people with disabilities to make their own decisions. Very often it is based on status, you have this type of disability, therefore you must be under guardianship. That's the case in much of the former Soviet Union, for example. Sometimes it is based on function. 
There are other models that are more progressive, that we'll talk about in a moment, in which people make decisions with you rather than for you. But in any case, the line is not clear between the two. The result of having guardianship in much of the world historically has been very bad, to say the least. Some of the worst practices include involuntary institutionalization. I have visited some of these institutions and they range from what are deemed to be humane institutions, but we put that in quotes, where people are clean and well-fed and are receiving medication, but never get to leave the institution. And it goes down and down and down. If you wish to see the, the horror side of it, and I have visited these, the work of Eric Rosenthal and what is now called Disability Rights International, which Professor Cantor was supporting from way back when, and we've both had the honor of doing work with him, documents many of these instances of persons being left strapped to beds, strapped to the floor, left in their own bodily fluids. Other effects of, of guardianship procedures have been involuntary sterilization, a process that still continues around the world, and it's not only with people with disabilities. A recent European Court of Human Rights case looked at a practice in the Czech Republic where Roma women, otherwise known as gypsy women, after delivering would be sterilized, the idea being that they ought not to have more children. If we look at the facts underlying many of the cases parked before the European Court of Human Rights, you will see that the underlying cases involve persons who are put into institutions by their families and having their properties stolen or stolen or moved otherwise. Practice of everyone had to be under legal guardianship if they had a disability, and anyone who had a disability could not vote. The European Court in a case called KISS, uh, in a brief written by my SJD student when he was at a disability rights center and a brief that I wrote in support of it, threw out the blanket process of not allowing anyone with this particular type of disability to vote. So we are seeing this. So Article 12 is a recognition of individuals as persons. It means that people with disabilities have a legal status equivalent to others, that they receive support where needed, and therefore, because it actually raises the cultural issue of those people being the same as us, those people with disabilities always being equal. To be fair, though, and to turn around on the other side, although we know very clearly what is wrong with legal capacity practices and stripping of legal capacity, we have not yet had enough information or enough time to understand what goes into the basis of intelligent, supported decision-making. There are some very interesting examples in the Canadian provinces. There is some interesting work being done in Sweden. To be bluntly honest without naming them, I did a one-day workshop with donors on this issue who are supporting legal capacity experimentation and small grants. And they're very concerned that both experimentation go on, but also that there be representation. And I hope I don't get into too much trouble with this, but this area has been largely driven on the advocacy front by persons with psychosocial disabilities. And on one level, that's great, because they are among the more marginalized groups. On another level, when you look at some of the positions, you have to wonder whether they apply equally to all persons, including to those with intellectual disabilities. And so the committee, which we'll talk about in just a minute, has decided in thinking about legal capacity to take its time and to see what evolves out of the jurisprudence. There are at least five cases lodged right now before the European Court of Human Rights that I've put in amicus briefs to. There are, no, there are 11 that are coming up, but the bad practices are clear. The low-lying fruit is very clear. Well, how is this, what is this convention going to do? And I'll keep us on track. One thing that's an effect of it is, again, this great law reform act that, that we described. And here, countries have to balance economic, social with civil political rights. There are some countries too far to one side. The United States is too far on civil rights. There are countries too far on the others. For at least the last 12 years, the Japanese community has been talking about adopting an anti-discrimination law, and they're absolutely right about it. Uh, but they've also been talking about adopting the Americans with Disabilities Act ADA type model. And we have to remind them that it's their choice to do as they please, but Remember that Japan has the fewest lawyers per capita in the world, and the ADA is driven by confrontation. It has created an expressive effect, meaning that DPOs around the world can point to this convention, 
and say, this is our right to participate, this is our right, our government says that we have human rights. Believe it or not, when you've been repressed for so long and you live in dire poverty and social exclusion, having the UN say you're human, you're equal, and your government agree to it means a lot. In Korea, even after CRPD ratification, we did a training. But after the training, which was on employment, one of the young men who had quadriplegia asked, why would an employer hire me? I'm only worth half as much as a normal person. His words, not mine. Why would he want to hire me? So we pointed to the convention, which his government had ratified and taken great leads in, and said, your government says that you are of value. You add value to society. This is what we mean by an expressive change. We are seeing this around the world. And we are seeing the DPOs expect to be included, both as part of the convention's mandates and clear text, and as part of the dynamic in national action plans, in disability law writing. In the first meeting in Vietnam on the disability law, which was passed until the night before, the ministers did not want disabled persons to attend. And we kept negotiating back and forth, and I said, no disabled persons, no disabled law professor. And it wasn't until late at night that they agreed to that. And then when the disabled persons attended, they were allowed to ask one question, and then they were ignored. Later in the process, at a wonderful uh, event, which Professor Cantor provided a lot of support on, on the legal drafting, we actually wound up and sat around tables and argued with each other with a lot of guidance from Professor Cantor and others on what should be in that law. So the idea of participation is taken forward as a norm. Finally, it's a matter of attitudes. It's a matter of individual attitudes and state attitudes. It's a matter of individual attitudes as in disability rights champions versus disability rights resistors, but also compare the, the differences in attitudes between parents. Most parents are wonderful and do the heavy lifting and advocate for their children, but not all. And again, ultimately, it's a matter of attitudes. And it's always a matter of priorities. It's a matter of, I can't tell you how many I've spoken to who say, if only we had money, we would do disability work. And then you say, but you're doing poverty alleviation, aren't you? And they say, yes. You're doing education for all, aren't you? And they say, yes. You're doing HIV and AIDS awareness and training, aren't you? And they say, yes. You say, well, why isn't disability part of that work now? To keep us on time, I got it. CRPD committee, there is a committee which is tasked with implementing the convention. Uh, it is now in its full size uh, of 18 members. It meets twice a year for one week in Geneva. The sixth session is coming up in September. Um, it has now been expanded to 18 people. To my knowledge, and, and correct me, um, every one of them, to my knowledge, has a disability. The chair who was elected just as the 12 were ending, and some of the 12 left because that's how it was created, some had to cycle off, uh, is an amazingly intelligent, capable, diplomatic, politic person with a disability, Ron McCallum. Having said that, they meet for one week twice a year. They are starting to receive reports from states, and they are already behind on their reporting because they are not given the resources or the time to get through these reports. So when DPOs talk about writing complaints, I think, frankly, it will be a long time before we see them respond to individual complaints. I think if they respond to any complaint, it is more likely to be a joint or systemic violation. They very wisely decided to hold off on their comment on legal capacity, their interpretation of it, until more information is available. But they're moving forward with a comment on accessibility. And that'll give great guidance to persons. Um, so I guess I should end here only by saying that the difference between rights on paper and laws and treaties and reality on the ground is all the people in this room. You are the ones who are working every day on your own behalf, on behalf of others with disabilities, on behalf of communities, on behalf of other individuals with similar interests, the women's sector, the children's sector, here in Israel often, the Israeli Arab sector. You are the ones who are doing the work every day. You are the champions. You are the ones who are making law into reality. And so it is a great honor to be here with you, and thank you so much.